grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Elizabeth Lovell Milford, pastor of Heritage Presbyterian Church in Ackworth, Georgia. Welcome to our virtual worship service for Sunday, October 18th, 2020. As we continue to gather in this digital space during the COVID-19 pandemic, we are glad that you have connected with us. Whether you are watching us on YouTube or Facebook, know that you are welcome here. We hope you will join us on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. for our live premieres, but know that you're also welcome to come back and view this video at a later time as well. Please, either way, leave us a comment to let us know that you have joined us in worship. You can also email office at heritagepres.com to connect with us further. We will continue to worship in these virtual spaces in the coming weeks as we move fully into phase two of our covenant of care plan. This Sunday, we have added the opportunity for in-person worship with a small person watch, get, watch party in the sanctuary beginning at 1030 a.m. In order to make sure we help stay under our capacity of 25 participants, all who wish to attend are asked to pre-register. Priority will be given on Mondays or Tuesdays for those without internet access or who live alone. And then open registration will begin on Wednesdays, as much as our space will allow. You can call the church office or use the link provided in the newsletter update or post it on our website in order to register for next Sunday, October 25th. There are many opportunities for us to gather both virtually and in person as we continue to learn, serve, and grow in our relationships with God and with each other. I want to highlight two of them for you that are happening next Sunday, October 25th. First, the Heritage Presbyterian women are holding their fall gathering at Swift Cantrell Park in Kennesaw starting at 1230 next Sunday. The time will include a shared meal, fellowship, and mission project related to Santa's caravan. You can contact Mary Lynn Chandler or Jane Ullum for more information. Next, our first Heritage Presbyterian Church Kids Club of the year will be on the afternoon of the 25th at 4 p.m. as we share an outdoor fun and festivities on the church grounds. All those are invited, who wish are invited to wear costumes and bring any outdoor riding and toys as we enjoy fellowship, a short devotion, and a special scavenger hunt for treats. You can register for both of these events or for worship using that same link in order to register. To learn more about these and other opportunities for connecting with us as a church family, visit our website at heritagepres.com or follow us on Facebook. Friends in Christ, near and far, God connects us in love. So come, let us prepare our hearts to worship God, our Creator. Let us worship. Let us worship. Let us worship.
as those who have been gathered in God's grace, let us call ourselves to worship. God has given us this beautiful earth and all that grows and runs upon it. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. God has given us breath to live and spirit to sing. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. God has gathered us into a community of care and discipleship. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Let us worship God with love, thanksgiving, and praise. I'm going to live so God can use me. I'm gonna pray so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm gonna pray so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm gonna sing so God can use me anywhere. Sing so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. In Exodus, the Lord says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Trusting in God's grace and love, let us confess our sin. Oh, oh God. God. You search, you search after, after us when, when we have gone, gone far from you. you. Yet, Yet we confess that we have been consumed with our own affairs. affairs. We seldom pause to listen for the wind in the trees or hear the happy voices of children. Sometimes we feel that the burdens of the world fall entirely on our shoulders, and we have been slow to put our trust in you or cooperate with others. We do, we do not thank you, nor pray as we should. Forgive us, Lord. Draw us into your presence and reveal to us your grace. Transform us yet again, that we might be your servant people, reflections of the one we claim to follow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just as God placed Moses in the cleft of the rock for protection and the fullness of glory passed of the Lord passed him by, God shields us, covers our sin with the hand of protection and tucks us into the rock of our salvation. Hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Speak to us, living God, as you have spoken to our ancestors, through the voices of your prophets, the breath of your spirit, and the life of your Son, so that we may live according to your word, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verses 1 through 7. Let us listen to the word of God. 
Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and strip kings of their robes, to open doors before him and the gates shall not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break into pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places, so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me, so that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make weal and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things.
will set a feast for them. My hand will save. Finest bread I will provide till their hearts be satisfied. I will give. Our gospel reading for today comes from Matthew chapter 22 verses 15 through 22. Let us listen for the word of God. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If I could sum up the message for this week, I might be tempted to do it with a simple question. Where do your loyalties lie? We all like to ask these sort of questions because it's good to put labels on one another and categorize each other in ways for us to reasonably predict each other's behaviors and thoughts or gauge our own interest or comfort level with pursuing relationships, or engage in some banter and maybe even lighthearted fun. We are a people who like to sort. Harry Potter fans like to know which house you would belong to. Psychology and personality indicator gurus seek to know your Enneagram number or Myers-Briggs personality type. Sports fans need to know who it is you root for. But of course, sometimes this penchant for organizing and labeling others takes on larger and more significant themes, too. We know this from our context right now, right? In the midst of a contentious political season in our country, of a presidential election, of hearing about a Supreme Court justice nominee, and in the midst of a global pandemic that has almost everyone scrambling to figure out which expert advice to follow and how, Questions like this become almost traumatizing to name. But here we find a context that is more similar to that of our gospel text. The Pharisees you see are presenting a gotcha question to Jesus. They're trying to figure out where his loyalties lie. To God or to the Roman emperor? It was a delicate balance, you see. 
It's a question that puts Jesus at tremendous risk, no matter how he answers. You know that phrase, damned if you do, damned if you don't? That's where he is. However, the master of our faith sees what's coming at him on this first day of what will become our holy week and instead pulls the focus to a new direction with his answer. Rather than getting entrenched in some political debate, rather than categorizing or tidying things up once and for all, he broadens their perspectives and gives them something to think about. Jesus goes to the theological heart of their question. And in that cast a much larger spiritual vision for how God's people are to live their lives. Now there's much to be said about this and what it might mean for us today. But rather than weaving among several different theological interpretations this week, I'm going to share two lengthier reflections with you that I found inspiring as I reflected on this text in my study. The first comes from writer and womanist theologian Debbie Thomas. In her lectionary blog, Journeying with Jesus, she says this. Jesus takes a Roman coin, a coin that honors the Roman emperor as a deity and offers the Pharisees and the Herodians an ambiguous both and answer. Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and give to God the things that are God's. How typical of Jesus not only to respond to a challenge with an even greater challenge, but to insist that the relationship between faith and politics is too complicated to reduce to platitudes or tweets. It's important to stop here, she writes, and note what Jesus does not say. He doesn't say that there are two distinct realms, the religious and the secular, and that they require our equal fidelity. What he says is a far more subtle and complicated answer. The coin is already the emperor's. There's his face stamped right on it. So give it to him. But then consider the much harder question. What belongs to God? What kind of tribute do we owe to God? The Roman coin of Jesus' day bore the image of the emperor. From the opening chapters of Genesis, we know that human beings are created by God. We bear God's image. God's likeness is stamped on us. God's signature is written across our very being, which means, if we keep this analogy going, that we owe God everything, our whole and entire selves, and that any fantasy we have about dividing up the secular and the sacred is simply that, a fantasy. We cannot separate Jesus's, Caesar's realm from God's realm when everything, everything belongs to God. But what does it mean to give God what belongs to God in these hard and divisive days? How do we bear forth God's image while our families, communities, and churches splinter over political and cultural differences that seem unbridgeable? How do we live into the all-encompassing reign of God while a scorched earth, ideology-driven, the ends justify the means divisiveness reigns within American Christendom? As Christians, we don't have the option on fudging the love and mercy of God for some greater political end result. We can't isolate our political choices and actions as if they don't reflect who we are as image bearers of our creator. If everything belongs to God, then our spiritual lives and our political lives must cohere. They must not contradict one another. Which is to say, what is technically legal is not always compassionate. What is politically expedient isn't always just, merciful, righteous, or life-giving. Our political leaders are not our gods. Our rendering unto Caesar must always take second place to what we render unto God. So, Debbie Thomas says, when I look to Jesus to think about how to practice my faith in the political realm, I see no path to glory that sidesteps humility, surrender, and sacrificial love. 
I see no permission to secure my prosperity at the expense of another person's suffering. No evidence that truth-telling is optional. I see no kingdom that favors the contemptuous over the brokenhearted. And no church that thrives for long when it aligns itself with power. Christians have spilled much ink over America's current political situation, and every argument and counter-argument has been made ad nauseum. As far as I can tell, no one has the heart to listen to our opponents with genuine curiosity or compassion anymore. But maybe this is exactly the place where Jesus' teaching becomes the sharpest and most relevant. As an image bearer of a loving, forgiving, and gracious God, maybe what I owe God in this hour is the very grace and generosity he extends to me and to all of us. Figuring out my taxes is the easy part. What's much harder is living out my political convictions with a Christ-like humility, with a compassion that embraces my political other as a brother or sister. But if I really belong to God, if I really am fashioned in God's image, then I need to practice my faith and my politics in ways that reflect who God is, whether I like the current resident of the White House or not. It's not a question of backing down or of being dishonest or of watering down my beliefs. It's a question of remembering that the God whose image I bear is a God of endless and sacrificial love. So yes, by all means, give the emperor what belongs to him. But remember that our first loyalty is to a kingdom that will remain long after earthly empires rise and fall. Caesar's realm is limited and temporal. God's reign is eternal and all-encompassing. Give to God what is God's. In short, give God everything. I think Debbie Thomas is spot on. This text isn't just about politics, though, but the very way we live our lives. And pastor and theologian Will Willimon offers more on what this would look like. He offers that Jesus would make us in this passage move from just politics to the broader way we live our lives as a way to point us to the most central part of our lives as God's people, worship. Here's what he has to say. Worship is the service that we render to God. Worship is when we give God God's due. Therefore, let us interpret this exchange as not so much a debate about church-state relations, but rather a conflict over worship. We are to worship no one except the one who owns us and everything else. Watch what we worship, and you can learn a great deal about our ideas of ownership. When it comes down to it, he says, most of our debates about state-church relationships, about the ethics of Christians, are at heart debates about worship. To whom do we give our highest allegiance? In whose image are we stamped? Who owns us? It's only natural that we should ask Jesus about politics. Politics is everything for us. Our protector, our main source of meaning, our only means of doing good. Jesus appears to care less. He refuses to answer a political question and makes it a liturgical question instead. Whom do you worship? Jesus, Jew that he is, knows that whenever we discuss anything of great significance, deep down it's a question of worship, or to put a point on it, idolatry. John Calvin famously said that the human mind is a permanent factory of idols. We so want to find some other means other than God of security, protection, and comfort. For some of us, it's the government. For others, it's pills or self-image. The list is endless, for we are resourceful in our idolatries. But church is where we go to be faithful to the first commandment. Church is where Jesus shows us that our cherished values are golden calves. So then we never get beyond the first commandment in our faith. You shall worship this God who has stamped you in his image and has delivered you from slavery. We've got to return here 
week after week and keep examining who owns us, who delivers us, who commands us. It's always about worship, Will Willimon offers us. I'm inclined to agree. And in fact, if we keep this spirit of worship and sense of honoring the divine in all we say and in all we do, I think we might likely navigate our own lives and way in the world with the kind of grace and truth and love that Christ called us to in the first place. Or at least we'd get a little bit better at it with time. Our worship, then, has to begin with giving over all of who we are, all of what we have, all of our time, our energies, our talents, and more in a spirit of praise for the one who gave it to us all in the first place. And this is good news because it can put us into a spiritual way of living that gives us the kind of new life the resurrection is all about. Earlier this week on Facebook, I saw a post that read, during the next 28 days, please don't let the elephants and the donkeys make you forget. You belong to the Lamb. I wonder if this is a modern take on what Jesus was getting at. Give to the emperor what is the emperor's, but don't let that be the be-all, end-all of your identity in this life. Instead, Center your lives around the one who created you, who loved you, who promises to always be with you. Give your lives over to the one who calls us together in community from all the four corners in the world. And make sure that the lives you lead show others where those first loyalties are. Friends, we have been created in the image of God. We have been called together as God's people. We are a part of a church of which Christ is the head. So come, let us bear God's image in our lives. Let us live in the light Christ shines upon us. For the Gospels demand nothing less. Amen in response to God's word for us today. I invite you to join with me in our affirmation of faith, which is from our Presbyterian Church USA brief statement of faith. In, in life, life and, and in, in death, death, we belong, belong to God. God. Through, Through the, the grace of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ the, the love of God, God and the, the communion of the Holy Spirit, Spirit we, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, Israel whom alone we worship and serve. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, let us pray. Loving God, you are steadfast, forever enfolding. You have created us in your image and called us to worship and serve you with all of our beings even when we try to distance ourselves from you, put other idols ahead of you, fail to accept our neighbors as your beloved, or cannot even accept ourselves, you are faithful to us, continuing in steadfast love and covenantal promise. And so we come to you today in prayer. We lift into your tender care those whose bodies, minds, or spirits have been weakened or crushed, we pray especially for those who have been impacted by COVID-19, for those who are rebuilding their lives in the wake of natural disasters, and for those who are weary with grief. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We lift up to your compassionate grace those whose burdens, guilt, or fear seem too massive to bear. We pray for all in need 
particularly those stories that were heard this week as we met with families for interviews for Santa's caravan. We pray for those who are carrying heavy burdens of addiction or mental illness, for those who have borne tragedy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We lift before your expansive mercy those whose hatred, rage, or vengeance cannot be contained. We pray for broken relationships and contentious conflicts. We pray for divisions of politics in our country and tensions around these elections. We play, pray for places where discrimination continues to weaken our communities and for those working to dismantle systems of oppression. We pray for first responders, for public servants, for those serving in our military who give their lives in service that others may live in safety, freedom, and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we come before you longing for renewal within ourselves. May your spirit empower us to imitate you by receiving those who feel judged and rejected, by walking alongside those who despair, by encouraging those who tend to the broken, by affirming those who labor in love. Receive all these prayers, loving God, and those we hold in our minds and hearts this day. Fill us with the light of Christ, that we may follow him through the work of your spirit as we seek to be his disciples. And now we join faithfully in the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You might have thought with today's scripture passage and a consideration of the stewardship of our very lives, that it is about this time of year when we ordinarily come to you with a themed approach from stewardship and finance to begin looking toward the following year as our leaders make financial and programmatic plans. Not surprisingly, the pandemic has shifted our timing on this aspect of our ministry and discernment. And our stewardship and finance committee is prayerfully working on plans for our future. We intend to hold some focused conversations on stewardship in early 2021, rather than this fall. That said, you are of course always welcome to communicate your giving intentions with the church at any time in the year. We continue to be grateful for your ongoing generosity and faithfulness to our mission and vision as Christ Church. We rely on your gifts to sustain our ministry needs and to follow where the Spirit is leading us. There are several ways you can continue to give from a distance. You can mail a check to the church. You can arrange for a check to be sent to us directly from your bank, often using the bill pay feature. You can give online at heritageprez.com giving or give from any mobile device using the Give Plus app. The psalmist reminds us that the Lord has made the heavens and the earth belongs to God. As Jesus taught us, let us return to God the things that are God's own committing ourselves anew to joyful service and faithful stewardship in all aspects of our lives. Most of all, in all that we say, in all that we do, in all that we are as a church, may it be to worship and praise the Lord God Almighty. Thanks be to God. scriptures tell us to go forth 
to declare God's glory among us so all the nations will know of God's wondrous works. May we go from this time of worship ready to respond to the grace of God with every fiber of our being. May we bear the image of Christ to the world. And as we do, may the blessings of God, the mercies of Christ, and the encouragement of the Holy Spirit be with us today, tomorrow, and always. Amen. Amen.